that passage to launch into moving our lives from where we are into an even better place. Now, you're at a, a pretty good place in life, really, all of us. But God has always got better for us. He's calling us to not just a good life or an okay life or a satisfactory life, but an abundant life. And so we need to be moving into this better place. One of my hobbies, other than eating chocolate, is to think about how organisations function and why they operate the way they do and why they're dysfunctional and how we can help organisations work in a better way. And pulling together a whole lot of studies, I find that it's about these four key elements. If you want to be a productive person in your workplace, what you need first up is a positive relationship with your manager. That probably means more than anything else. HR 101 says no one ever leaves a job. They always leave a manager. And some of you know that only too well from your own experience. So a relationship with a manager is number one. Relationship with colleagues, a sense of having a, a team, of being together, of, of being supportive of one another, ranks behind that. Number three is the relationship with the organisation. You've got to believe in what the organisation stands for, what they want to do and, and how they're moving forward. And then finally, you also need a good relationship with yourself to know that I'm the right fit for this job. I've got the skills that can do it. And when those four things come together, you've got a great workplace and you're working well. Great sense of team. What's the one thing that's consistent in all four of those? It's all about relationships. It's not about the product or the service or anything else. It's always about relationships. Turn back the clock a couple of thousand years and guess what? It's what the Bible has been saying all along. In your relationships with one another, this is what makes it work. You've probably seen this before. It's an ancient symbol trying to express the Trinity. It's one, but it's three, and everything's intertwined. There, there is no parallel of the Trinity anywhere on earth. And so artists have struggled to try and explain what that is. Equality and relationship working together relationship is what God has always been about. And so it's no wonder that he wants us to have good relationships as well. And when you turn into the New Testament, you find that one another, the relationships we have with one another is woven right through Scripture. Page after page talks about how we're to relate to one another and the good relationships that we have. So our text tells us that relationships are a priority for God and they're a one another. There's a mutuality. If you don't have a two-way relationship, you don't have a great relationship. It's got to work from both sides. And the best way to do it is, little surprise, the one who invented relationships, who works with relationships, who came to express relationships, have the same mindset, have the same attitude, have the same viewpoint and actions that Jesus himself had. So all that was just a run-up for those of you taking notes. Here is point one of the three that we want to see. Step up to my true position, to step up to who I truly am. And we find that when we come from verse 5 into verse 6, which says, Jesus, who being in his very nature God. Now, it comes no surprise to you that Jesus is God, wrapped up in a human body. This is really important because all of Christianity, everything that we are doing here, stands or falls on the fact of who Jesus is and what he did. His death and resurrection. It's all about Jesus dying and rising again. And if you want to mess up Christianity, then try messing up 
the resurrection. How important is it? This will give you a clue, if you hadn't already guessed. If, and it begins with if, we need to point out, if Christ has not been risen from death, then our preaching is useless, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins, those who have died are lost forever, our hope in Christ is only for this life, and we are more to be pitied than anyone else in the whole world. We're wasting our time. You should be in bed or at the beach or somewhere if Jesus has not risen from the dead. But don't stop yet. Don't stop until you get to the next bit that it's about to say, which is, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. That has changed everything. Go, come back. To, I want to stick with this. John chapter 2. This is really, really early in Jesus' ministry. Months in at the very most. And the Jews responded to Jesus, What sign can you show us? And here's the key. To, sh to prove your authority. What makes Jesus so important that he can say and do the things that he's doing? Jesus' answer is the resurrection. Destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. The temple he'd spoken about was his body. Kill this body and in three days' time I will bring myself back from the dead. That's the measure of the authority that Jesus was claiming. Move on. Chapter 2 through to chapter 10. Jesus is unpacking this further to explain what's about to happen. No one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. Remember Jesus on the cross. One of the last things he ever said was, he dismissed his spirit. That's what makes a person alive or dead. If you don't have the spirit within you, when your spirit leaves, your body falls apart. That's the end of it. No one can take his life from him. I have authority to lay it down. And here's again the key element. I have the authority to take up my life again. Not only did he have the authority to dismiss his spirit and become dead, but he had the authority to step back into his body and bring it back to life again. No one else, no one in anywhere in history, past, present or future, has got that measure of authority. That's who Jesus is. And that's why the apostles could then look back from the book of Acts and say, God raised Jesus from the dead. Oh, better just hit pause for a moment. There's a wonderful sidetrack that we could go down but won't to note all three members of the Trinity are involved in everything that Jesus does, including the resurrection. So they're saying, God raised, but Jesus said, I will raise. They're working together. We're going to ignore that sidetrack, as fascinating as it is, because we've got other things to talk about. God raised Jesus from the dead, freeing him from the group of death because it was impossible for death to hold him. He has authority over life and he has authority over death. Nothing could keep Jesus down. He's got authority even when he's dead and buried. And so when we move on, and here we are moving up to the book of Romans, the context is important here because th this is a really important verse. It tells you how important the resurrection is. It's about salvation. If you, number one, declare with your mouth, Jesus is my Lord. Now, we sit here in comfort and safety and can say, Jesus is my Lord. That sounds fine. Put yourself back into the middle, late middle of the first century. If you were to say, Jesus is my Lord, you'd be saying that instead of saying, Caesar is God. And what you are doing is writing your own death sentence because it's a very quick trip from saying Jesus is my Lord to becoming food for lions. So this is why we keep saying in the ABC of salvation, admit, believe, commitment. 
This is a total commitment. This is a life and death commitment. And these people could say with their mouth, Jesus is my Lord, and they could say it because, number two, they believe in their hearts that God raised him from the dead. And so as they sign their own death warrant, they could do so with the confidence that there is more to life than being lion food. They are going on to eternal life. God raised him from the dead and you will be saved too. It's that measure of the resurrection is the guarantee of our salvation. We want more. Whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. It doesn't matter whether you're in this body or in your eternal body. You still belong to God because he has authority over life and death. The reason Christ died and returned to life is it so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. He reigns in all areas of eternity, life and death. There are lots of other paths through life that you could choose. And no disrespect to any of them, because all of these fellows said helpful, wonderful good, noble things. But none of them have any authority except the authority that their followers choose to give them in this life. And then it ends. Because none of them have authority in life or in death. As is proved by a simple fact that guess what is common with all of them? They're all dead. And they're staying dead. They have no authority, as Jesus did, to bring themselves back again. And nor did God grant them enough authority for him to send them back again. They have no authority. And so it doesn't matter what religion you might want to choose or follow. Ultimately, they will all collapse because none of them measure up to the authority that Jesus has. Now, whether we give it or not, he still has authority and he has authority beyond the grave as well. Look at this. Here we're turning back the clock even further to John chapter 1, the beginning of all things. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. Now it's talking about Jesus. Jesus is God. We've already seen that through and through. By the way, in eternity before there was anything, his name was not Jesus. Jesus is the name that was given to him by the angel to Mary as he was coming to clothe himself in a human body. Jesus is his earthly name. In eternity, he was known as the Word. And the Word became flesh at the first Christmas and dwelled amongst us. We've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father. Now get this. He's different from everyone else because he came into this world. You and I have a different starting point altogether. Eternity is out there. But we have our starting point. Little Angus has his starting point in time, in space, here. And ultimately we will travel this length of time and then we will step out of this body, this earthly body, into eternity. And it's a one-way trip. But Jesus was in the beginning, was already God, and the Word became flesh as Jesus, stepping into time. He died and left time and space. But he rose again. He came back to be part of this world, proving that he has authority to come and go. He has authority in both realms. And he's now reigning in heaven. That's the second half of the section that we won't get to this week. So to round off this John chapter 1 passage, we've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father. And how did he come? full of grace and full of truth. And so when we come to our, our actual text for the day, 
we find that we are to have in our relationships this same mindset that Jesus had. You don't need to be a great people person. You just need grace and truth. And with that, you've got the foundations for building great relationships. So if I'm to step up to my true position that we find presented to us from verse 6, there are two things that we need. First up, I've already got God's blessings. We dealt with that last week, so we're not going back there again, other than to just show this one slide. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has done what? Who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every every spiritual blessing in Christ. We're blessed. Done deal. Tick it off. But there's a second thing that we find in our true position. If I'm going to step up to be who I truly am, then I need to not only have God's blessings, but the fascinating thing is I need to have God's nature and it's absolutely doable. You need to to really get your head around this. If you, if you take away nothing else, grab this, because it is so, so important. How often have you heard someone said, or said it yourself, I'm guilty of it, oh, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. And how wonderful that is, to be a sinner saved by grace. But it's a cop-out for wusses. Yes, you were a sinner. Yes, you are saved by grace. But that's all past tense. Now, you know what you are? You are a saint. Yes, you are. You are a saint. You don't have to wait until you're dead. Scripture tells you that's your position now. When you are in Christ, you become a holy one. You become a saint, saint and holy one. They're, they're exactly the same word. And you're still saved by grace. Once you know that your true nature is holiness, once you know, yes, this is who I am, I am a saint, I am to be saintly, I am to be holy, that starts to change your whole mindset. And you can then let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. A mindset of holiness makes a difference to your relationships. And so we're going up. The escalator has taken us upward. He has given to us his great and precious, precious and magnificent promises so that through them, guess what you get? You become partaker, sharer, participant in the divine nature. This ought to be mind-boggling stuff. We're sharing the very nature of God, which is holiness, righteousness, purity. That is our nature now. That's why you're not a sinner saved by grace. That's why sin is an anomaly in your life that needs to be constantly minimised. It's why we are growing and maturing and becoming different people, holy people, saints, right with God. So not only are you a sinner saved by grace, you can add to that. I am not only those things, but I am a saint that is living living out and living in grace and truth. That's what's going to make a difference in who I am, how I see myself, how I address my circumstances and how I do relationships with God and with other people, saved and unsaved, living in grace and truth. So with that as a step up, we're then able to do the next obvious step, which is to step down. And that's what we find in the very next verse, to step down in my true practice. And I can practice what I am when I know my position. My position steps me up, but my practice sets me down. So verse 7, we find in Jesus, 
he takes the very nature of a servant. As he had the very nature of God, he takes the very nature of a servant. This is truly who he is. The key verse in Mark's Gospel is this one. Jesus himself says, The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to be the servant, to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many, from servant to saviour. So the steps down. There are a gazillion examples. Here's just a few of them. Each of you, take great comfort in this because it's talking about you. Every single one of us has received a gift. So what are you going to do with it? Go on. What are you going to do with it? We're going to serve one another. It's another of the one another passages. We need to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. God's grace gives you a gift. That gift makes you a steward. Good stewardship needs to be expressed through serving one another. That's what we're doing. Another place. You were called to freedom. How good that is. But do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, do it again. Serve one another. This is the nature of God. What we, pro- uh, what we proclaim is not ourselves. As great as we are, it's not about us. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake because we're following him. And the, the greatest accolade that you could possibly receive when you step up to heaven and meet him face to face There is no higher praise than to hear him say, Well done, good and faithful servant. That's what we are. That's who we are. That's the very nature that we've been given as we follow Jesus. So we are servants. But it's also helpful to add, I think, co in there. It's not just me having to serve you or you having to serve me. But we are all co-servants together. We're all in this together. We all share the same nature. We are all working together. Let's push it further. Always go further. You've been set free from sin and have become servants. It goes even further than that. You've become slaves of God. You're always slaves. You were slaves of sin originally and now you've become slaves of God. Why? Because you are not your own. You were bought at a high price and the price was the blood of Christ who purchased you out of that slave market of sin and brought you into God's palace. Jesus Christ is our Lord. Here it is again. It's about the Lordship of Christ, the one with authority. So you see how it is? I choose to be a slave to God's law. I am a slave, but I've got to choose to live out my practice, to move from my position to my practice. It's got to be the choice that I constantly make. And here's some good news for you. I am no one's slave. You are no one's slave. You're God's slave, but no one, no one here, no one there. You are not their slave. That is quite contrary to everything God says in Scripture. So you put these two things together. I am everyone's co-servant and I am no one's slave. Is that good news for you? I think this is fabulous news and for some of you it's a great relief to know who you are and what you're not. So that takes us to our final uh, verse. I need now, having stepped up to my true position, down to my true practice, and I now need to step out into my true calling and that's what we find in Philippians 2 verse 8. Being found as appearance in man, Jesus humbled himself. He was already gone from 
God to man but now within that role he humbled himself now get a good look at the picture because it's a really important picture for some of you this is a doormat this is not a picture of you and therefore you are not to allow people to walk all over you you're not a doormat Rick Warren is a famous California preacher at the moment he said humility is not thinking less of yourself thinking oh me oh my I am just a servant I'm just a slave I'm just a sinner saved by grace that's wrong it's not thinking less of yourself it's thinking of yourself less it's not about me at all you can go on then and live your life when it's not about you he hijacked the thoughts from C.S. Lewis uh, from uh, a much earlier thinker who said a really humble man will not be thinking about humility oh I've got to be humble now I've got to say the right thing I've got to do no nothing like that at all he will not be thinking about himself at all you just go on and live out who you are and your position as a servant and automatically humility flows this is also important Jesus humbled himself he didn't need someone else to cause him to be humble so this is something else you'll need to take away with you one person can humiliate another and some of you have been on the receiving end of that where you've felt humiliated it didn't make you humble it just humiliated you humility is only something that you can impose on yourself because it's such an attractive quality whereas humiliating demeans both the giver and the receiver of that humility is always an attractive attribute and it comes out in so many virtuous ways that it's always always a wonderfully inviting uh, quality or virtue so Jesus not only humbled himself but he did so by becoming obedient and there's a parallel here one person can make another person compliant I can force you to do something but it doesn't make you happy about doing it you know the story well I'm doing it on the outside but on the inside <laughs> I'm somewhere else altogether uh -huh. someone can make you compliant but obedience like humility is a virtue that is self-imposed I choose to do this our, our word obey doesn't look like it originally started it, it uh, comes from a, a Latin word which means to hear now to get from here to obey uh, doesn't sound like it's an easy fit but when the, the Romans would hear the trumpet the legionnaires would charge into battle to hear the trumpet meant to obey and that gives us the um, the little phrase that we sometimes use to hear is to obey men say that every day at home <laughs> to hear is to obey and, and it's exactly the way that the word obey originated we hear the trumpet call there's no options now but he humbled himself by becoming obedient again in this total way there was obedience even to death knowing that Jesus is Lord Jesus has authority in life and death one of the many fascinating sidetrack that we're not going down again but one of the many reasons why the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil how did he do that? Well, if you go all the way back to the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve ate the fruit. Uh-oh, things have really gone. I wonder, was it pear-shaped or was it something else? that they, We don't know. Whatever it was, 
God spoke to Adam, he spoke to Eve and he gave a promise to Satan in the Garden of Eden and he said, he will crush your head but you'll strike his heel. That's the authority that Jesus was going to come with to crush the head of Satan and we are in Christ. We can't do it alone. Foolish to try. But in your relationships with one another we need to have the mindset of Christ. Even when we are faced with sin and Satan and and the worst that the world can throw at us. So, just to round it all off. Have the same attitude as Jesus had to myself, knowing that I'm the one who shares God's holiness, God's nature. This is who I am. My true nature is holiness. I need to have the the same attitude that Jesus had in his relationship with God. I am his obedient slave, where anything that God requires of me Nothing else matters that comes first and foremost. In my relationship with others, we are not slaves, but we are co-servants with one another. And in our relationship with Satan, we're to stand with Jesus and have his head crushed under Jesus' feet as we stand with him. So, come on guys, get the lead out. Put your running shoes on. Up, up and at them, don't be slow. Go and have this attitude that Jesus had in all the relationships that you have anywhere. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you that you grant to us this wonderful mindset, this wonderful new nature, the fact that we can be in Christ. And now our desire is that We would not just know it in theory, it would not just be aspirational, but it would be the reality that being in Christ, we live out who we truly are as holy people, that we put into practice what it means to serve with one another and to celebrate our victory, your victory, which is our victory over sin and Satan and everything in the world. Lord, bless us as we seek to be your obedient slaves through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.